Okay. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to the OEB Global Debate, uh, which is, has become an annual event, and um, I think uh, normally is, is uh, good fun for those who haven't been before, and that's one of the main purposes of it. Um, my name is Harold Ellotson, and I'm the chairman of the debate. Uh, which means that, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to enjoy myself as much as you are because you're all going to be able to take part in the debate and I will have to, a bit like Jeremy Corbyn over Brexit, remain neutral and, uh, and try to preserve a little bit of order. Um, this is a parliamentary-style debate, which basically just means that we have a bar open for the whole of the debate. Um, for those of you who know our parliamentary system, that will perhaps register. Um, I just want to tell you before we get stuck in, because we're a little bit tight for time, how this operates for those who haven't um, taken part in one of these debates before. We have four main speakers, two for the motion, two speakers who will speak for the motion and two who will oppose the motion. Each of those speakers will speak for 10 minutes and then I will throw the discussion open to the floor. Uh, and then you have an opportunity to make a short, and please, I mean short, because I will cut you off if you start rambling on, short contribution. Let us know your, your opinions about what the speakers have said, or ask a question. If you ask a question, please make it clear whether you're addressing it to all the speakers or just to one speaker. And if you address it to one speaker, then I'll probably ask somebody from the other side to, uh, to comment it on it as well so that we have um, a little bit of fair play. Um, this debate is very important. And uh, I always give the, the rider with these debates that the speakers may not necessarily um, agree with everything that they're saying. Uh, when we've had the debates in Africa, that's, that's been quite uh, a necessary thing to do. But here, I think on this occasion, I think we genuinely do have um, four speakers who all believe passionately in what they're saying. And this is an extremely important debate. Uh, and. Uh, I wish, I wish I could take part, because I certainly have, uh, have views on it, but I'm going to remain neutral. But the motion for debate is this House believes that an obsession with economics is harming education and undermining the skills we need for the future. And I'm going to call on our first speaker to propose the motion. And he is David Toborek, who is head of IT at Metronom GmbH. And he's responsible for growing the Metronom hub in Berlin and has previously worked for numerous companies in product management related roles. David will speak for the motion, and he has 10 minutes. Thank you. Over to you. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm going to start with a very bold statement. This house believes that education in its most fundamental form is broken. And it's broken through the ones who promised it to be ready for the future, who promise and believe that Taylorism is the one answer that is going to solve all our amazing, beautiful problems. It was aimed to make education competitive. It was to make the country and the people ready for a new age. Or to put it simply, prepare people to enter the labor and job market. Um, as a young boy, I was not very bright. At least that's how I count myself. And I don't think I can count myself today as very bright. But if I can share my educational story so far is that I was born and raised in the beautiful country of Germany. You might say highly developed country with many opportunities. Well, it was a journey of frustrations and loss of hope. I pursued uh, at the very beginning um, and at the very early stage I was, I, I was told 
My dear David, what you can become at a later age is a construction worker, a mechanic, or potentially a painter. And the authority that I so much aspired and dreamed about to guide me into the right light gave me very early to understand that my mental capabilities are not enough in order to aspire for a better world. The challenge also that we are facing here on top is the fundamental challenge that businesses are facing every single day. Businesses don't know what they need for the future. I mean, look into the disruptions that are happening the last 10 and 20 years and how fast startups are raising up, generating billions, and how slow companies are in adapting. So if the company and the economy doesn't need what, know what it needs, so can education not know what the business needs. And if we are not careful, we are not going to start labeling education as a form of inspiration, but as a form of skill factories. And let me tell you, governments, the public education is going to lose this battle. The role, the fundamental role of education is to provide subjects and to raise curious citizens who are driving for new ways. Teach ethics, literature, history, physics, biology, whatever is needed in order to succeed later in life. And what is hunting you, what is hunting us all, is the fact that the one determining factor for today's success is the ability to change the ability to adapt to change. And this is the one and only contributing factor of making companies highly successful or stories of bankruptcies. I worked for such a company. <laughs> Indeed. Eastman Kodak Company was in 2002 one of the most admired companies. Ten years later, they nearly vanished from the picture. Companies today are very well aware of the lack of preparations that universities provide. We are fine with that. We have found our ways to deal with that. And we have found ways, better ways, more efficient ways, in order to skill up the people we need. The free market is capitalizing, as you all are seeing with the developments of startups even there here on the exhibition, on the broken system. And the public sector should see itself as complementary or as laying the foundation. By nature, companies can react faster to changes. Decision making, whatever you call it, it's a shorter ways. And if we are looking into the prediction of the future, by 2025, the global e-learning market is expected to have a sizable income of 300 billion US dollars. The global boot camp market, so if you're looking into people who want to get into tech, is by 2021 to be expected 500 million dollars. And all of those companies have missions, visions, that are truly in the spirit of what education should be. Le Wagon, complete your education. After universities, many young people feel like they are missing the necessary skills. Udacity. Our mission is to empower careers through tech education. We partner with leading technology companies. Coursera. We envision a world where anyone, anywhere can transform their life by accessing the world's best learning experience. Udemy. Staying ahead of the future of work. The frightening fact also with all those tech-based businesses is they usually know more about their students than the teachers about their students. Statistics, completion rates, attendance rates, and so on is all available by the push of a button. Looking at the trends in education, we are clearly observing an inflation of degrees. 
MBAs, postgraduate programs, whatever you call it, they are bombarded and offered everywhere. But the only thing I care as a company, or we, is who you are as a person. Integrity, trust, an open spirit, an open mind to change to whatever is brought at you. So what about hard skills? What is your potential is the only question that we ask. What is your potential drive to adapt to new information? So some of the most prominent, brightest, and most profitable companies are already doing that. So if you're looking to Apple, Google, Amazon, Whole Foods, Deloitte, they don't care. They care about the person who is in front of the interview and tells them who they are and showing as well what they can learn. For me, this is a very emotional topic, as, uh, as you can uh, slightly uh, observe. Um, and there are various reasons for that one. But one more point is that also technology has changed the way how, how one of the lacks in education itself can be fixed. So there's Stack Overflow. It's ranked, according to Alexa, the 38th most prominent and more popular website worldwide, with over 10 million members and 18 million queries worldwide. The authority established in this community is not by your title. It's not by what you have completed. It's not by whatever else you have finished. It's by how much you contribute towards the community. And everybody can, in an instant, validate how helpful what you said is for the rest of them. We shouldn't want future generations to do more than to contribute towards the GDP. We shall want future generations to become adaptable, to change, and have broad interests. And as Research by the Michigan State University, and also with so many numerous examples in the past, the likelihood of getting a Nobel Prize, hooray, is what? Having a diverse interest. Your likelihood to get a Nobel Prize is 2.85 times higher if your interest is beyond your field of research. Art, literature, whatever is called the beautiful art. So why am I saying all of this? Well, first of all, after leaving Germany at the age of 18 and being labeled a miserable Finnish, I returned. I returned after six and a half years with a bachelor's degree, with a high school degree, a master's degree. I managed to apply for a PhD and work for numerous companies. But this moment of leaving everything behind you because you have nothing else to go for, that hurts. That really hurts. I am now 34. I'm a parent. I'm a father. And I just want one thing. That my daughter does not go through the same stuff. Because losing hope, it freaking hurts. Believe me, it freaking hurts. And this is why education should focus on building citizens on creating them, on giving them the inspiration and the drive they need for life to adapt to change, to think of the impossible for dreamers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, David. That was a really impressive example of um, German precision because you were bang on 10 minutes so thank you for keeping to time absolutely to the second unbeatable so I'm now going to call on our next um, speaker who is Olivier Cluet to, uh, Cluzet, rather, to uh, speak against the motion Olivier is the head of pedagogy at 42 which is a disruptive educational model and coding school and he's been involved with the establishment and the design of the peer learning or training model of 42, which is a free 100% project-based IT school without teachers, lectures, or traditional knowledge transfer. Olivier. Well, thank you, Harold. 
Um, dear uh, audience, it's an honor to be uh, here in front of you uh, today. Um, I have a question for you. Maybe some of you already have some uh, children, and uh, I'm guessing that you want the best for your children, and you will probably act to prepare the future of your children. Let's start uh, small, uh, just a baby born. At some point, well, usually it's around one year old, he will start walking. What are you doing for your baby uh, when he will uh, need to start walking? Will you keep him isolated and then at just one year you give him a lecture about gravity, about forces on his legs, and then you ask him to stand up and to walk and to succeed at the first time? Hopefully, I guess it's not working exactly like this. No, you are connecting your baby to the real world and your baby it will try and fail and try again and we'll have some example of adults walking around him. From my point of view, education is deeply connected to the, inter the real world and it needs to be in strong interaction with the real world. I'm coming from France. If you ask, you get pick up some uh, random uh, people in France and ask him about this obsession of economics into education, I think he will probably laugh at you. Because unfortunately in France, education is far from an obsession with uh, companies, with the labor market. I was actually a little bit surprised when I saw the statement the first time. In the public education is definitely not connected at all with the labor market in France. We have almost no connection between university and the companies, for example. And as David already stated uh, during his last intervention, thank you, David, for supporting uh, our side. Um, <laughs> public education is deeply uh, bound to the previous industrial revolution, and we are today living a, a new industrial digital revolution, and unfortunately, uh, a public education is still connected to the value and the need of the previous uh, revolution. What's the result? Well, in France, uh, I don't know here in Germany, but I guess we have a, a more heterogeneous audience today with a lot of people from different countries. Uh, in France, we have a huge unemployment. That means that public education is not at all giving the skills for now and is not even uh, trying to give the skills for the future for our children. So, with a degree, you definitely do not are sure to get a job at some point. <coughs> so the result is public education in France is not developing the skills for the future. On the opposite, if you take with uh, at least my French vision of what's happening in the USA for a long time now, you have a strong and deep connection between labs in university and companies. How many times this collaboration didn't bring some innovation? How many times this kind of collaboration between university and uh, companies led to shape the future? How many patents have been issued from uh, this uh, different kind of, of collaboration? Education and labor market uh, are deeply interconnected in the US and from my point of view, they are creating the future. If you want to prepare your child for the future, if you put them in a situation where they do not have to imagine what the future could be to prepare themselves, but in a situation where they will be able to create their own future, definitely it will be way better for your children. I guess you have probably all in your pocket your smartphone. How many um, collaborations of such kind have been involved in creating your smartphone? How many students from Berkeley, from Stanford, from the MIT, and probably a lot of other uh, US universities have been involved in, let's say, at least the minimum, the software that is uh, making your smartphone run? 
it's huge, it's a lot. And it's the result of this strong connection between the companies, which is between the economy and the education. I'm running an ICT school, a coding school in Paris, still uh, connecting with uh, the software I was talking about. The school is called 42. In 42, we also choose to have a strong connection with companies, a strong connection with the labor markets. It can be conferences, it can be hackathons. We have side projects, not regular projects of the curriculum, but side projects, and students will earn some credits because they are doing these side projects with the companies. We have, of course, internships and a lot of job offers. What are the feedbacks from companies? Well, they are telling us that they do need uh, collaboration skills. They do need this think-out-of-the-box skills. They do need innovation and diversity amongst the people, because from diversity, usually, you have more innovation. We choose by design to create a pedagogical model. It's called peer learning. Maybe you know a little bit about the peer learning of 42. We have no teacher. We have no lecture. It's 100% hands-on, project-based, peer evaluation, gamification, and so on. By design, this model will, of course, develop technical skills, coding skills. My students are able to create a piece of software. But it will also uh, develop the expected soft skills by the companies. What we want here is definitely to create an agile state of mind for our students. With this agile state of mind, they will be able to face whatever the future will bring to them. With a learning context that is close to the company and the uh, expected uh, uh, skills, uh, jobs are very easy to find for them. We have a lot of job offers, we have a lot of internship offers, and that's a priority for our students. They know how to be adaptive, they will answer the need and the expectation of the company, and then they will get a job. And in this country, in France, with this huge unemployment, it's a first step for their well-being. Maybe they would like to have a little bit more of global culture, but at first, the first priority is definitely to get a job. And we are definitely succeeding at this. Finally, um, we have a problem in ICT. Well, it's not a problem, actually. ICT is evolving very fast. The technology that is used today, in five years, in 10 years, well, well this technology will change. The language, coding language, will change. So we also decide that by design, our peer learning model in 42 will bring some problem-solving skills to our students. Will bring this critical thinking that uh, is, is missing and that will help them to be able to face any kind of uh, new situation they will have inside their uh, future uh, career. What we want here, what we need here, is a sustainable job. I don't want to train my students and after 10 years are coming back and telling me, hey, the coding language you taught me 10 years ago, well, it's completely obsolete and now I need to be trained again. We definitely want to avoid this and to have a sustainable career. That's why we decided to have this very strong connection with company, this strong collaboration. Education is one step behind. At least the minimum we can do is to stick with the economy so our students and so our children will be able, at least at minimum, be able to have a job right now and hopefully to also have the skills uh, expected to be able to face the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier. I'm now going to call on um, Professor Paul Kirchner to speak for the motion. Paul is uh, Emeritus Professor in Educational Psychology at the Open, uh, Open University, and he's also a research fellow of the American 
Educational Research Association and uh, a research fellow at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study in the Humanities and Social Science. Paul. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Back in 1939, in 1939, Abraham Flexner wrote an article in Harper's Magazine entitled, The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. Flexner is a famous education reformer and is founder and first director of the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, whose faculty members include Albert Einstein, Kurt Gödel, John von Neumann, and George Kennan. It was striking that the content of the article was still so timely, 80 years later. In his opening paragraph, he writes, from a practical point of view, intellectual and spiritual life is a useless form of activity in which men indulge because they procure for themselves greater satisfactions than are otherwise obtainable. In this paper, I shall concern myself with the question of the extent to which the pursuit of these useless satisfactions proves unexpectedly the source from which undreamed of utility is derived. Flexner begins with a conversation that he had with George Eastman, the founder of Eastman Kodak Company. Flexner asked Eastman who he thought was the most useful scientist in the world. Flexner answered, uh, 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 Eastman answered, Guglielmo de Marconi. Flexner answered that although the radio had been an immense value to people's lives, Marconi's contribution was practically zero, a mere practicality. Yes, Marconi was legally the inventor, but what did he invent? He merely added the last technical detail to what, to that point, was pure science. Scientists such as James Maxwell, who studied mathematical calculations in magnetism and electricity, and Heinrich Hertz, a theoretical physicist who studied electromagnetic waves. They laid the foundations for Marconi's final step. Maxwell and Hertz did not think utility or application. They studied stuff based upon pure curiosity. According to Flexner, neither Maxwell nor Hertz had any concern about the utility of their work. No such thought ever entered their minds. They had no practical objective. Hertz and Maxwell could invent nothing, but it was their useful theoretical work which seized upon by a clever technician and which was created for a new means of communication, utility, and amusement by which men whose merits were relatively slight have obtained fame and earned millions. Marconi was a clever inventor with no thought but use. And giving some ex uh, additional examples, Flexner concludes, most of the really great discoveries which had ultimately proved to be beneficial to mankind had been made by men and women who were driven not by the desire to be useful, but merely the desire to satisfy their curiosity. Institutes of learning should be devoted to the cultivation of curiosity. And the less they are deflected by considerations of immediacy of application, the more likely they are con to contribute to real human welfare. After reading the article, two things gnawed at me. The first is our increasing hang towards applied research. It's not strange to see governments launching competitions or holding electronic town meetings with students, teachers, parents, schools, and other interested parties. Note the absence of educational and learning sciences here, scientists here, to create innovative curricula and innovations of core inv objectives and learning outcomes. In the Netherlands, they've gone it a step further. Dutchies have even had the opportunity to express their thoughts on required scientific research in general to determine which studies could be should be prioritized for funding and execution. There was even a Facebook vote with likes to determine what research project should be funded in the field of medicine. In other words, both the content of and the approach to education as well as the direction of scientific research should be determined through something similar to a referendum to determine what the population thinks should be funded so as to maximize 
added value, to maximize valorization and economic applications. In other words, science must be driven by thinking in terms of efficiency, utility, and economics. Let's now take a short detour, namely, that industry really has no idea what they'll need in the future. As a fellow of the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study, I studied how to educate our youth for not yet existing professions. I prefer to call this how we can future-proof our learning. During my research, it became clear to me that industries and their futurologists, trend watchers, trend matchers, and other clairvoyants haven't a clue. Take, for example, Talwar and Hancock, who came up with a list of 110 future professions, including memory augmentation surgeons, climate change reversal specialists, and virtual clutter organizers. Do we really think that this is the case? And if so, can we even devise curricula for this? If we look at the prognoses from earlier generations, the professions and jobs that those psychics have thought up in no way match what we're seeing today. With each new thing, industry and infrastructure scramble to catch up in spite of all their learned forecasts. With all the economic and technical, oh, sorry, take something as simple as what we need with respect to our electricity infrastructure. I'm talking about the masks, the masks, the cables, the distribution centers. With all the economic and technological developments in solar panels and wind energy, national grids are now scrambling to find ways not to meet the increased demand, but rather to meet the increased supply of electricity. They don't know what to do with all the electricity we're creating. They now need people to solve a problem that they should have long seen coming but didn't. So much for industry's ability to determine what's useful and what's needed. The best industry can tell us about education is what they need to know now. And in the slim chance that they know this, by the time the first graduates arrive on the job market, four to six years, years later, these oh-so-necessary graduates will be out of date. But wait, is four to six years even feasible? If schools and universities start today to renew their curricula based upon what industry says or thinks that they need, It'll take them years before they have retooled and provided education. Then the new students can actually begin studying. My research brought to the surface that the best way to future-proof education is to concentrate on providing future-proof education, which requires knowledge, laying a foundation of useless basic knowledge, skills, applying this knowledge in a broad range of situations, and metacognition, creating situations where the students can think and reflect. The second gnawing problem stems from an art article that I read in the Times Educational Supplement, written by Sugata Mitra, some of your gurus. He writes, knowing is an obsolete idea from a time when it was not possible to access or acquire knowledge at a moment of need. The idea of knowing assumes that the brain must be primed in advance for circumstances that may require knowledge just in case. He adds, we don't need to know until we need to know. Whoever knows Johan Cruyff, the famous Dutch philosopher and footballer, might think that he actually came up with this. Cruyff, for example, said, if I wanted you to understand it, I would have explained it better. His American equivalent and counterpart, Yogi Berra, said, stated, you've got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you just might not get there. Let's go back to Flexner's argument, namely that so-called useless knowledge is actually a foundation for further, deeper, and more creative thinking. Knowledge that at first glance might be perceived, perceived as useless is actually indispensable, and in that it enables us to book technological, economic, and societal progress. Without this useful, useless knowledge, we wouldn't be able to recognize problems, let alone think about them and solve them. Mitra and his followers don't bring us further, but rather move us backwards towards the Middle Ages, when due to a lack of knowledge, people thought that the sun orbited around the earth, that the diseases were caused by humors, 
that an eclipse of the sun was caused by the gods and that by sacrificing a virgin would bring the sun back. Today we see this with flat earthers, anti-vaxxers, and dietitians who say that eggs are bad for us because they are the menstruation of chickens. Real. Without all of our useless knowledge, it would be impossible to understand anything of what happens around us, judge it, or develop ourselves as individuals and societies. And last but not least, without this useless knowledge, we wouldn't be able to intellectually communicate about anything. The consequences would be devastating, stagnation and decline. John Stuart, not the comic, but the 18th century Scottish English philosopher, wrote in The Revolution of Reason something to the effect of, Wisdom and knowledge are strongly connected. One is the complement of the other. Knowledge leads to wisdom, and wisdom cannot exist without knowledge. Or take Steve Jobs, not my favorite person. He once said, creativity is nothing but connecting things. If we replace the word things with knowledge, it would read, creativity is nothing but connecting knowledge. However, according to Mitra and Confederates, this knowledge is superfluous. Why don't they realize that without knowledge, we lose the ability to be creative? Do they themselves lack the necessary knowledge to see this? Creativity is nothing more than coming up with novel and useful ways to use seemingly useless knowledge. Our obsession with economics and utility is harming education and undermining the skills we need for the future. I rest my case. Let us all say, Amen. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I now call on Edith Hoge, who is um, going to speak against the motion. And uh, she is the Professor of Governance in Education at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. And she also serves as the Chair of the Netherlands Education Council, uh, which is the governmental advisory body which provides advice, both solicited and unsolicited, to the Ministers of Education culture and science, and to parliament and to local authorities in the Netherlands. I'd like, I'd like to tell you the stories of Laila and Tony. Laila is an 18-year-old, and she has just succeeded the final exam of secondary school. Her marks are high and school has equipped her well with knowledge and academic skills to study economics at university. However, Laila has always been interested in graphic design, and from age 15, she created her own internet company, making posters and visual, visual compositions for concerts and events. Laila has no intention to go to university. Her dream is to continue her business but she has no clue of how to expand it successfully, how to take risks. And school, at school, she has learned nothing about entrepreneurship. Let's go to Tony. At 16, Tony drops out from school and starts working in a local supermarket. Due to his organizational and social skills, he develops into a supermarket manager within three years. His boss allows him st study opportun opportunities, so he starts following part-time adult education. At 21, he passes a state exam, and he decides to interrupt his career as a supermarket manager to study history. Maybe he become to become a history teacher. Okay, these two stories about Lila and Tony are illustrating my reaction on the absurd and myopic statement here today. <laughs> I'll repeat it. An obsession with economics is harming education and undermining the skills we need for the future. But we're here to debate, so not to tell stories. And I will explain my argument with two statement, statements. My first statement is, the current great gap in many countries between economics and education is actually harming education. Second, 
if only education people were struggling to satisfy employers and meet the demands of the labor market to a greater extent, all students would benefit. I'll explain these two claims. So first, the current great gap in many countries between the world of work, economy, economics, industry and business and the world of schooling, training and education. It is actually harming education and it is undermining what education is for, to equip young people for life. Today, in many countries, education is not sufficiently focused on preparing young people for the world of work, equipping with them with the knowledge, expert, expertise and skills that their future employers need and that they need themselves to become entrepreneurs or employers themselves. John Dewey, I'm not referring to Johan Cruyff here as a Dutch woman, but I'm referring to an American philosopher and educator. He addressed, John Dewey, the problem of isolation of schooling from life, isolation of schooling from economy, from social life, from industry, from society. And he addressed this problem already at the beginning of last century. And he referred to this isolation of schooling as a great waste in education. Dewey argued for a free play between the school and the needs and forces of industry. With Dewey, I argue that school is not meant to prepare for any particular business. And it's not meant to serve narrow, short-term interests of industry. Of course not. But education should be intimately related to social and economic life. Breeding critical and resilient citizens, professionals, employers, employees and entrepreneurs. That requires an adequate education system from preschool to higher education, closely linking school with society as a whole, with the world of work and balancing the different purposes of education in a sophisticated way, which is quite a challenge for many education systems. So if you still follow me, we're now with the second argument I made. And I said, if only educa uh, education people were struggling to satisfy employers and meet the demands of the labor market to a greater extent, extent and not only think and talk about education in terms of pedagogic interactions and general education. That would be useful because to equip young people fully for life, um, good quality education requires to balance and economic needs and societal needs and the needs that are inherent to education. Let's say it in French with my partner in crime, l'éducation pour l'éducation. Paul, thanks for uh, agreeing with this already, because you mentioned, referred to this as useful, useless knowledge. So these are three um, purposes of education. And this can be done by integrating general and vocational elements in the school curriculum. Well, I'd like to inform you a little bit about this general education and vocational education, because many countries could thoroughly improve their vocational uh, education at present and integrate it as an important element of general and university education. I assert that young people will benefit from such strong and adequate vocational education and training. For instance, countries such as Switzerland and Germany having apprenticeship systems that are closely integrated with labor market institutions and the industry and businesses. These countries show very low youth unemployment rates from 1.5 to 6%, which is very low internationally. My own country, the Netherlands, has a different model, an equal distribution between school-based general, general education and employment-based dual systems of apprenticeship. And also in the Netherlands, we have a low youth unemployment rate from 7%. The other way around, in countries with originally limited vocational systems, such as France, Portugal, or Spain, and Olivier here already explained this a little bit, 
youth unemployment rates are high, from 19 to even 32 percent. These countries are aiming at turning their fragmented, industry-led, uncoordinated systems to integrated vocational general schooling systems, which is a good aim in order to improve uh, youth on the labor market. To conclude, school, society as a whole, and the world of work, economics, need to be closely intertwined in order to breed well-literate, critical and resilient citizens equipped with sufficient knowledge, expertise and skills to fight their ways or survive in current and in future complex societies. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Edith, and thank you to all our panel speakers for those uh, excellent opening presentations, setting out the, their arguments for and against the motion. So now it's open over to you, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, who would like to kick off with a question or a comment on anything you've heard so far? I did see somebody waving at the back. Uh, when Edit was speaking, but I'm not sure if that, that was uh, an attempt to catch my eye or just um, somebody trying to be friendly out there. But it's not waving again, anyway. Yes, second row. Well, we're going to the one in the front. I'm not really sure that the panelists are that far apart because they're basically agreed that. I mean, the purpose of education and training is to help people live better lives. But what I do wonder about is, when we do agree on the objectives, is higher education the right vehicle for this? Like, we talk about development of the person and these types of things, but is there any really evidence that higher education or higher and further education is any good other than teaching people stuff? Is there evidence that you can develop attributes of people. Perhaps, perhaps the best place to learn about life is life and the best place to learn about work is work and maybe we've gone past the idea of full-time education for people when they leave school because we don't need it anymore because we have technology. We can, people can leave, go into the workforce get their degrees, learn the stuff they need to learn, which I agree, they need to know stuff to be able to make judgments. Uh, but as for the personal attributes that people believe they should be developing, maybe college isn't the place to develop those. Maybe they're no good at it. And now we should use the very arguments that almost all of you are making to say, that's it, stop mass going to college, you know. Okay, thank you for that. Let's have a quick reply from both sides on that, David. So from uh, my side, um, considering I saw uh, both sides of the, of the picture, especially when we are thinking about the lower types of education, the one thing or the one skill that you are actually missing when you are at the very bottom is what is actually out there, know how to go through all of those content, how go through all of the uh, amazing articles and books that I got recommended during university is like, that during university, the first thing that you actually encounter is the broad possibilities of what's out there. That was actually for me the, the one encountering point. And only then I was um, taught some of those skills in those, what, you, what some people are saying about critically thinking, about analyzing, checking resources and questioning everything that you're actually reading. So I think that higher education is absolute standing because when we think about the, let's say the pure definition of what studying actually means is changing the way to think. And with that sense, I think I fully agree that it's necessary because on the lower roles, it's, it's not really being taught. Okay, thank you for that. Paul, did you, or, or uh, Olivia? Uh, you know me now, by now. Um, okay, right, I got it now. Um, I think it's a blanket statement that you make that's unanswerable. And the reason I think it's unanswerable is the following. Uh, what I stated is to future-proof education, we need knowledge, laying a foundation, skills, applying this knowledge, and metacognition, creating situations where they think and reflect. And I think that's the third point that you're talking about, getting people ready, 
thinking and reflecting about. And so I can say, yes, there are some universities that actually spend quite a lot of time and quite a lot of effort doing that. There are other universities which probably don't do that. So I know it might be a, a killer statement like this, but making a blanket statement about are universities the places to do this, I can choose any other is the workplace, and I know of quite a long number of different workplaces where you're told to just keep your mouth shut and do your work. Are workplaces the places to do it? I think it's as nonsensical a blanket statement as this non the statement, are universities the proper place to do this? Hi, um, I'm Leonie, I'm a student. I might be one of the youngest persons in the room. I'm 26. And there was a lot of talking about uh, the future of our children. And um, I was thinking about, well, um, if I'm looking at the children who are fighting for the future at the moment, those are on the streets on uh, Fridays, in a way. And I was wondering, um, how does this all, whole orientation on the market really um, help our, uh, the kids there? And that was something that I was wondering. And it plays maybe in another question that I was noting, because um, David said that markets are capitalizing on a broken system, and maybe the provocative statement here would be, did markets break the education system? Thank you for that. I think I'm going to ask um, both sides to, to answer that in their summing up because they'll both have a chance to speak for five minutes before we vote on the thing. So perhaps they could address that in the summing up. I want to take two or three more contributions before we ask them to sum up. Yeah, there's a hand up there, I think, at the end of that block. Hello. Um, there was almost a killer argument that in... Holland, for example, Germany, that only 7% youth unemployment compared with the Fra France with almost 30%. But you're making the assumption that uh, the young people who are not employed are not doing anything else useful at the time. Um, so you are arguing against economics by using an economic argument. Thank you for that. Yeah, Jilly, down there, front row. Uh, hi, Jilly Salmon. I promise I won't sit on the fence over this one. Um, I'm from the UK. Yeah. Um, who should be paying for students to be prepared for optimizing their contribution to their personal careers, to society, and to world economics. Do you want an answer you to want that? You want to answer that now? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, as long as it's foundational education, it's the government, period. Um, uh, everything from uh, four, three, two or three or four years of age uh, up through um, the end of university in which we hopefully prepare people um, uh, conceptually, uh, cognitively, possibly also socially for the future. That's the job of the government and of no one else. Okay, Mr. Chair, may I, because I think there's too much, our, the other party is too much on the ball to continue with Johan Cruyff. So I would like to, to react on some comments that are, have been made. Uh, the first about uh, the young Hang on a minute, if you could just reply to that question because you're going to get a chance to sum up in a minute when you okay. can yeah, reply still, to the comments yeah. that have been made I more generally. I will address one but. point. Um, I, wasn't arguing ag I wasn't arguing, we are not uh, arguing against economics, we are uh, arguing pro and I um, didn't uh, suppose that young people who are unemployed, they d that they don't contribute, not at all. They, they, but the only thing I was uh, pointing at that I think they deserve a proper job to participate in the world of work. Thank you for that. Um, another question here on the front row. 
if we allow um, business to interfere with our learning outcomes, but we don't know whether the learning out the goals of the business align fully with what we as society want for our people. Um, the same business actually that also is uh, kicking people out, out of jobs, by robotization. Okay, thank you. We've got time for a couple more if anybody else wants to comment or ask a question. Yes, just below the camera there. Um, good evening. I, in my opinion, I think industry should assist or facilitate education, but rather than dominate or orient uh, and education. Uh, in the title, I say a word obsession. I think this is too much. Um, education is not training. It should not, not, not be too specific or to have the um, specific aim. I particularly like the sentence usefulness of useless. I think uh, I'm a biologist. That's, that's a reality in biology. Like we have the genes that do not encode protein, like uh, called the junk genes, but it's absolutely necessary for our human body to function. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else? No? Okay, well, in which case I'm going to ask um, Edith to sum up um, for the opposition. Yes. You've got five minutes. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for your comments and questions, which I hope clarifies also a little bit our, our standpoint. Um, I would like to sum up in uh, the way that the other party, uh, David and Paul, they are representing, in a way, a very elitist point of view, which might harm the equal chances, equity, of young people to finally participate in life, as I have described this with uh, the help of good old John Dewey. Uh, of course, pure curiosity, curiosity and useless knowledge, um, they can be a fantastic foundation for uh, to build up and to learn skills and creativity, etc. But pure curiosity and useless knowledge for a long while during your school and even university career is pure luxury. And the question is, and here I come again with my economic point of view, can we afford that as a society? And will it be distributed equally? Because curiosity and useless knowledge. Well, it is nice to read a poem, but there will be no food on the table. And for m still, for many, many young people who are in our education system at this very moment, they don't have to back up at home, and they don't have all the tools and the social environment to yeah, kind of integrate smoothly in that, in that luxury knowledge uh, education system uh, our opponents are proposing. So it is, and I just repeat again uh, what, what, what Jui already said, it is really very important that schooling is preparing for many, for, for life, for work, well, and also for the luxury of knowledge and, and culture, uh, et, et, et cetera. And therefore, and thereby I would like to react uh, on the first question that was, well, maybe uh, we should, uh, there should be no universities anymore. Is it useful to have a higher education? I think this is not a question either or, but our proposition is that also higher education should integrate more than now is the case, uh, elements of vocational training, elements of preparing for entrepreneurship, elements of life to become, as I said, uh, to, to, to breed resilient people. And those resilient people, that youngest woman in the room of 26, um, she, she asked, uh, she talks about, uh, the, the young people in the streets every Friday, <coughs> I think um, they are concerned and they are also concerned about the sustainability and they are concerned about, I think, about the, the, the e equality and the opportunities that are, which are still left. And uh, especially for them, I think it's even more important to integrate all those elements uh, in, in education. So I think, yes, um, 
the education system we propose, the angle we think it should take. Uh, I think it responds very well to the needs of the young people today. Thank you. Right. Uh, now I call on Paul to sum up for the motion. Um, uh, as the acoustics here were so bad that I couldn't actually understand my distinguished opponents, other than the fact of the absurdity of my distinguished opponent, Professor Hoge, who uh, made the straw man of lecturing being the same as uh, teaching information and bringing across information. Um, as a fossil, I, I'll again go back to uh, a few years uh, ago, actually to 1935, to an article by uh, Edward Thorndike, who was uh, actually the, uh, from Columbia Teachers uh, College and founder of, uh, actually of educational psychology. And he stated the following. What I shall try to do is to present the case for something which is now despised and rejected by many of those active in adult education and in education in general, namely mere knowledge of facts, mere habits of conduct, mere skill and good tastes in small particulars of art. It is customary among the elite of educational reformers to disparage these particular small specialized items of achievement in favor of higher and more far-reaching powers, such as the ability to discover and organize and apply knowledge, versatility, readiness to change, to fit a changing world, and creativeness. When I read this, I think of 1935, it's now 2019, and I hear the bovine excrement of people dealing with 21st century skills, trying to tell me, number one, that they're 21st century, which they aren't, number two, that they're skills, which they aren't, and number three, that you can realize them without knowledge. Try communicating or solving a problem or writing something without any knowledge. Although I do know a number of colleagues who communicate quite a lot without knowing what they're talking about, <laughs> you can't actually communicate, you can't actually solve problems, you can't actually do any of those things, collaborate with others, without basic knowledge. But it's all available step step, online, uh, Paul. May I finish? May I, may I finish? Yes. Thank but you. But I just want to say that all knowledge is available for everyone. As I said, <laughs> you've had your chance to sum up. Stepping your back side. from elitism, as uh, stated by Edward Thorndike, and to accept the fact that there are facts, there is knowledge, and thus there is a basis for progress for both the individual and for society. Without knowledge, we're in the dark ages, despite what you might think about 21st, 22nd, or 23rd century skills. Thank you very much for that, Paul. So we've, uh, we've heard all the arguments, or if not all of them, some of them, uh, and we now move to the vote. This is not a particularly scientific process, I'm afraid, um, but uh, it'll give us a rough idea. So would all those in favor of the motion that this house believes that an obsession with economics is harming education and undermining the skills we need for the future, please raise their right hand, just one hand as well. And all those against? We won! I think um, <laughs> if I could call the result, I think you did indeed win. So I declare the motion is carried. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you on your behalf to all our speakers and uh, to everybody who's taken part. Thank you very much.